message uh, in the book of Romans today. So we continue um, this journey that we have been going through um, in the whole book of Romans. Amen. And um, I think we all now are we? Yeah. Amen. So um, please open your Bible on Romans 10 verses 5 to 13. And we're going to be um, uh, following the, that text verse by verse. Uh, may the Lord help us so. Just before, even before you stand to uh, read scriptures, I just want to remind you of uh, uh, the third commandment. The third commandment is in Exodus 20, verse 7. And I know the Sunday school in this class here was actually about the third commandment. I just found out that um, after the Portuguese service, and the third commandment says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Uh, it's a very serious commandment, especially because the second part that says, for the Lord will not hold anyone guilt guiltless who misuses his name. You don't use the name of the Lord in vain. Don't use the name of the Lord just by using. Don't, don't OMG. All right? Don't. That's not to use, don't use the name of the Lord unless you're praying or you're teaching or you're actually worshiping him. The name of the Lord, it's holy. And we are not, are called to don't use it in vain. Now, our, our message is call on the name of the Lord. How many people in this country, every Lord's Day in the morning, call the name of the Lord in vain? Preach and mention Jesus, God, saying God said, and he did not say any of that today, saying after that. May the Lord have mercy. We're not allowed to use the name of the Lord in vain in our conversations. Now, people use it and misuse it, wrongly use it, to preach a lie in the name of the Lord. How much guilty those people are in front of the Lord. I'm talking about the false prophets. And the people that have fallen them. May God help us. Amen. I know it's hard to probably use the name of the Lord all your, your life. In your conversations. You may have text OMG. Right? Because they make it so simple now. Right? TGI Fridays. And so many other things that use the name of the Lord wrongly. It's a prayer that I have to do many multiple times and continue and watching myself because once in a while, here it comes. And we just say it. You're not all, you, you can't say it. Unless you're praying, unless you're teaching about God's word, unless you actually have your mind in the Lord. A lot of people come to Christ and they start saying the name of the Lord in places that before they used to say a curse word. And they just replace it. For the name of the Lord. May God have mercy on us and help us. So it's a serious text today. You've been called. It's a wake-up call in the book of Romans for you to call on the name of the Lord. Be careful you don't do it in vain. Be careful you don't do it in your own flesh, in your own mind, a part of the Holy Spirit. His name is Holy. Very exciting. I'm very excited to start a new series on, uh, on the attributes of God. On Wednesday, not this Wednesday yet, this Wednesday we'll be doing a prayer meeting. And unless the Lord returns, we'll be starting a series, a long series on the attributes of God. And one of them, or the one that the Bible uh, 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 um, repeats more often and brings more light on it, is the holiness of God. Our God is holy. He demands us to respect and fear before his throne. His throne. So when you pray and when you talk, don't forget that uh, Latin expression, corundio, live in the presence of the Lord because you are always in the presence of the Lord. But live according to his will, according to what he calls us to do. If you find the text, please stand. Romans 10, verse 5 to 13. Amen? Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. 
But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the depth that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the ma that that is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord for all and richly blesses who calls on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father God, we come before thee in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, that it, may your word be so clear to us this morning. We may turn ourselves to you today and call upon your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I really love this text. I think it's a beautiful text. And just reminding you about last week, a little bit about last week, we speak about zeal without knowledge. And now that's dangerous, right? You may have a lot of zeal for God, but if there's no knowledge, oh, that's not salvation. That's not come from the Lord. That's not a work of the Holy Spirit. He brings light to our mind for us to understand scriptures. And to believe in it. You will believe something that you naturally will not believe. But that doesn't mean that's not a part of the knowledge of what God said. Amen? Now continue here. Paul says, Moses, uh, Paul, and when we say Paul, we say the Holy Spirit through Paul teaching the church of Romans and us today. And Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. How is the righteousness that comes from the law? The person who, lead, who does these things will live by them. All right. So you want to follow the law? You want to, you want to follow Moses' law? Now live by, by it. Follow all the commandments. Do everything right before the Lord. You'll be justified. There will be no guilt in you. Well, I just mentioned the third commandment and all of us. On the way on the other, I'm almost sure if I will ask each one of you, you already used the name of the Lord in vain, didn't you? So that's already make you guilty before the Lord. So it looks like verse 5 is just a wake-up call for us to understand that we cannot, we cannot be saved or we cannot be justified or right or make right or, or, or have our own righteousness before the Lord based on the law because the law will condemn us. And it looks like Paul for the these 10 chapters have been about that, right? Law and grace, law and grace and how grace works and how salvation works and how it is by faith and how the law keeps guilt, showing us that we are guilty before the Lord. But on verse 6 and there becomes the good news. But the righteousness that is by faith says and look at the righteousness that comes by faith says. He says, Two things. He says, You cannot, you do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is, to bring Christ down. You cannot say that. You cannot in your heart ever think that you can bring Christ to you, bring it to his work. And that's the difference between the religion of faith. There's only two religions in the world, actually. Is the religion of faith and the religion of works. That's all. Christianity is the religion of faith, and everything else is religions of works. Everything else is all the same. You just change the name, but it's all the same. There's no, no difference. And a lot of people have a religion of works based, so they think, in Christ. That's impossible. Because in Christ, you have a religion of faith. You have true faith in Jesus Christ. You are saved by that faith, by grace and grace alone and Christ and Christ alone. So watch out and be careful because not, not everyone that says the name of Jesus actually preach a religion of faith. A lot of, a lot of I'll say, over, over 
80, 90 percent of the people, like probably 90 percent of the people that preach Jesus Christ is a religion of works. Make sure it's a religion of faith. What is the difference? It's on verse 6. You cannot bring Christ down. You could not. There's nothing that you did that attracted Christ to come on this earth to die for you. He came on his own. We could not get there, so he came down. That's why I love Christmas. You know why I love Christmas? I love Christmas because we are celebrating that Jesus Christ came. I just do not, I just think Thanksgiving has its place. That's all. Some of you say, especially at home, they say that um, I love Thanksgiving over Christmas. No, I think it's a Thanksgiving time and it's a Christmas time. I explained this to my class before on the Sunday school time. I love Christmas. Christ came because I could not get to him. I could not go there. There's no works that I could have done. That will lead me there. He came on his own. He born. And we celebrate that wonderful miracle. When he born. And we keep celebrating every single year. It's not because the presents. I hope it's not. It's not about the decorations. Even that I love them. I think it's beautiful. We make this place beautiful. This campus is beautiful. We put, we put decorations all over the place. I love it. I love it. I love the food. The, Christ, the food around Christmas. The hot chocolate, right? Love the hot chocolate. But it's, the, uh, but it's because we're celebrating what verse 6 says, that Christ came. Verse 7. What else can you not say if you have a righteousness that comes by faith? What else you cannot say? You cannot say, who will descend into the depth that is to bring Christ up from the dead? You cannot make it happen. You cannot bring him up. He raised from the dead because his Lord, his King, is God. He made it perfect. He's a perfect sacrifice. And we, have, we can have a perfect trust in him because he raised from the dead. That's why it's so important that when you teach the gospel to someone, when you preach to someone, or you give a testimony, don't forget, he's not only, he's he not, he not just died, he resurrected after. That's why our cross is empty. When we put the tomb so the, the, the representation, we make it empty. Because what is he? He is in heaven. He is God. He raised from the dead. So what, that, what does the religion of faith or what does the righteousness that comes by faith using the, the terminology on verse 6 says instead, look to verse 8. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. And what word is that? And it comes to my mind, John chapter 1, the gospel of John. And the word became flesh. He came. Jesus came. And on verse 8 says, That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim what is it the message that we proclaim the gospel of jesus christ he is near us is near the believer how near how close it is where is it in your heart who put it there the holy spirit did you cannot do that you bring it to your heart and every time you speak it comes out of your mouth naturally Remember the Bible says that your mouth speaks while your heart is full? What is in your heart? What is, what's your conversation? The kind of conversation that you have shows what's in your heart. What is the main topic of your conversation? Your career? Your job? Your car? Your family? And that comes, money? What is it? If your heart is full of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will speak words of eternity. You will speak God's word. You will be happy to share the gospel with someone. You will leave. You will talk because it's near you. It's in you. The wonderful, it's so wonderful what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. 
And it's so clear there is a supernatural power of God that does it, that plants it in your heart, the seeds of the gospel. And it brings joy and it brings life. And when you speak, the way you walk, the way you live, it shows Jesus Christ, the Lord. The message concerning faith that we proclaim and he we hear clearly is not to pastors and the elders it is we the people of god god's people everyone leave this gospel and profess this gospel and, and this message of righteousness by faith not by the law by faith is in the heart and it comes and is in the mouth all the time in the verse 9 if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And before we even move any further, I just want to stop here for a second to think about Jesus is Lord. You have a lot of people out there saying, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is my Savior, Jesus saves me. And, but I want to tell you today, and you know this, if he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord, you, will, you, was, you, was, you haven't been ever, and you will not be your Savior unless he's your Lord. And if you saved, you know this. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You don't have somebody that just came and saved you. You have somebody that came, saved you, rescued from, the, from sin, from the condemnation, brought you to his kingdom, and he owns you. He's your Lord. And you serve him, you serve him with your life. This is the gospel message. It's not only that he's the Savior, he's the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Is he your Lord? Are you obeying his commandments? Are you serving him? Are you dedicating your life to him? One of the problems with the gospel message that people sell today, they just bring it out all the time, is like Jesus loves you so much, he wants to save you. A couple questions come up after this is, save me from what? I have a wonderful life. He says, oh, I'm going to make your life better. Oh, I take that. Now, that's not what it is. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is this. You are so lost in your sins that you deserve to be condemned by God. And the wrath of God will be upon you for eternity because you are guilty before him. Now, this is what you need. You need a Savior that will become your Lord. You will, dedic you will dedicate your life to him because he will save you. And you will be so thankful for this great salvation that you voluntarily with all your love of all the love of your heart you will serve him and obey him and live your life for the glory of thy name this is the message of the gospel he's not only your savior or he's only your savior if he becomes became your lord you cannot separate those he cannot be your savior today and your lord your lord in eternity is he your lord today How many people out there are confused with this message? How many, how many people out there are, are so ignorant of that Jesus, of the fact that Jesus is Lord? They even sing songs about it. Oh, Lord, Lord. Even Jesus said, right? They profess that I'm the Lord, but they don't obey me. They don't do my will. They don't do the will of the Father. Jesus was doing the will of the Father. You declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Okay, is that enough? You can say whatever you want, right? People say whatever you want. These people are telling so much, so much, so many lies, right? All the time. You ever saw those commercials that uh, the stove is all dirty and they just pass a sponge, and it cleans. So it's not, it's not, it's not easy. It's so easy, right? And you go like, that's what I need. I'm gonna stop scrubbing today. I can go order that stuff online. And they say, if it doesn't work, uh, your money is guaranteed. I, I can't can guarantee you now that it's not going to work. And you just spray, right? And you just pass, and everything is gone. They can say whatever they want. That's not true. You buy the product, and you scrub, and you scrub, and scrub. Maybe it helps a little bit, but still, so many lies out there. People say whatever they want. You know what's what's sad in uh, in Christianity? It's a years ago. People start saying, "You can say whatever you want, uh, and uh, God will do what He want." 
Just declare. Declare with your mouth and things will happen. You have the power. Your words have power. I want to tell you right now, your words have zero power. Right? You have no power in your words. You can say whatever you want. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. Does your words cause an influence in other people? Of course it does. Of course. It's obvious. Of course. You keep saying something, you may start believing it, even if, the, if, that's, a, if that's a lie. Or you may say something to someone and people start believing, right? You have, a, you have that all over, the, all over the place, right? You have somebody saying something, and, uh, and then you realize, well, it's not exactly that, but it looks like that person believes in their own lies, right? Which word has power? The word of God. He command, and things just appear. Do you understand creation? Do you understand how, how wonderful and, and, and marvelous that is, that God spoke and this all things just happen? And trees and animals and, and the sky and, and the, the kids on Sunday school, they learned this lesson right there. Just, it's, it's, not, well, no, it's not wonderful. Now, you, do you have that power? No. No. We don't. Just because you declare things with your mouth, that's just because you say Jesus is Lord, that is your Lord. So the second part of the same verse says, and believe in your heart. Now, it's not believe in your mind. No, it's not being delusion. Delusion. Delusion? Delusion. Delusional, thank you. That you think, speak things in your head. It's believing in your heart. It's only the Holy Spirit leads you to believe in him. You'll, you'll bring that truth in your heart. And you know it's true because the Holy Spirit planted there. The almighty power of God brought it in. Now you know. In your heart, you know. You believe that God raised him from the dead. Now, if you, confess, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him, Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. That's what you need. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn my phone down. So if you believe in your heart that Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, why raise Jesus from the dead and not that Jesus died? Well, if he raised from the dead, he had to die, right? Remember what I always keep, I keep repeating myself on this one, that the gospel is not complete. You did not complete told the gospel to someone unless you go all the way to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everybody dies. Some resurrect and died again, like Lazarus. Only one raised from himself from the dead and never died again, and that is Jesus Christ. That's Jesus. And because of the resurrection from the dead, we have an eternal hope. And one day we will resurrect with him and we will be with him forever. So you need to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You cannot make this happen. You cannot make this up. You cannot just create an idea about this. We live in a wonderful time. Do you know that? Very hard time to preach the gospel. Very persecution coming up all over the place. Problems coming up all over the place. But I want to tell you, we live in a good time in some areas. And one of them is this. The disciples saw Jesus Christ. They need to believe. But they saw him after the resurrection. Well, we didn't. Did you see? Did you saw Jesus Christ? Are you going to see Jesus Christ one day in heaven? Yes, you're not going to see him on this earth. But you need to believe without seeing. 
So if you're living according to God's word, it's because you believe in your heart. It's because the Holy Spirit led you, led you to believe. And now you believe with all your heart in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believe that he raised from the dead. Your hope is in Christ. Your hope is in eternity. You don't trust on this world. You don't need the things of this world because you have a higher purpose in life, which is serving the one that lives forever. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, if he's your Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. Is this true in your heart? Is this true in your mouth? And on verse 10 comes the explanation, for it, it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved combination of both the heart and the mouth i know it's true because i speak what's in my heart but with your heart you believe and now you are justified you don't become just you're not just on your own it's not by work something that you did and now you are just no it's because christ took upon him your guilt and now you are being declared, you have been declared just. You are just before God. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith. I, I don't understand that uh, kind of uh, 007 uh, Christians that uh, starts coming so popular today, right? 007? Undercover Christians? Nobody knows. Oh, you are a Christian. Oh, good. I'm too. I say, well, never notice. How's that? How can somebody be a believer and don't profess and don't speak about it? That's not true. One of the things that gets me all the time is when I'm kind of meeting or uh, something like, uh, like last week that I was away um, for work. And, and you try, right? You try your best. You don't want people to... You know, start asking questions. Where are you from? And this and that. So you try your best to speak a proper, uh, proper English, right? And, and then it comes the question: Where are you from? Uh, in New Jersey. Nobody believes. No, I mean like originally, where are you from? And here starts a whole conversation: How do you get to this country? And what are you doing now? And blah blah. blah. And it comes a whole conversation. And, and not that we have nothing to cover, but you're just trying to be professional. And here comes, why? Because he, I can't deny it. Uh, it's just even the way I said good morning or good afternoon or see you tomorrow, it, it, it's like this heavy accent, a mix of the Portuguese and, uh, uh, Portuguese and Jersey accent. I don't know which one it goes. And, and everybody knows it, you, why I'm saying this, because understand if you are a Christian, the way you speak, people will say like, oh, hold on. Not sure what that is, but it's not the same. What kind of talk is that? What, what is it? What is it? People got to know. They got to see. You are the weird one. Praise the Lord for the weird ones. The ones that are different. Everybody looks at them like, what? I don't understand you. Of course, because the, the, the word of God says the natural man will not understand the things of the spirit. And you are living because... And your life is, is clearly marked by the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. So it makes a difference. It's not the same. You're different. You speak those truths. You talk about those truths. You, you live according to God's word. You always have a Bible text to, to reference to something. People are talking about the weather and you think about God's word. And you answer a Bible verse. Have that happened to you? People are talking about the weather and you have this Bible verse ready to come out. Or a Bible truth ready to come out. Where that came from? From the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. you say, how are you doing? I'm great, but I'll be better. And that's a conversation that I love, right? It's the best day. Today is the best day ever. I love when my kids have a, uh, some activity at school. They come home and they say, today was the best day ever. And I totally agree. 
is one day closer from the return of Jesus Christ. It's the best day ever. And tomorrow will be, if we're still around, will be the best day ever. And day after day, that's the way it is. For it is, it is, it is with your mouth that you confess. You declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart. That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are not justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You profess your faith. Are you professing your faith lately? Does people around you notice that you are a Christian? Well, nobody can tell. Nobody can tell. Remember the, the, the young man that went to the army? It was like six months. The church prayed for him, and, uh, you know, he went. When he came back, the pastor gave him an opportunity to give a testimony, and he said, I'm so thankful to the Lord because nobody noticed I was a Christian. Nobody bothered me with that because nobody noticed. What kind of testimony is that? That's the, the saddest thing in the world. How come? There's no believer whatsoever. Can you be with a person for six months, or can a, a believer be six months somewhere, and nobody, not even one person noticed? There's no believer in there. That's, that's nothing. It's not because you scream very loud that you are a Christian. It's because you live like Christ. You look like Christ. The people that don't love Christ, they will hate you. Do you understand? They will hate you or you defend. They will hate you for your opinions. They will hate you because you always keep talking about God's word and they can't take it anymore. But the ones that are in Christ Jesus, the ones that have been called with the same grace, they will love you. They will hug you. They want to hear more. Remember what I told you last week? The man in the Uber preaching the gospel to me. And I was loving any, every, every second. And I know I was being a little deceiving, not telling him that I also believe in Jesus Christ. But it was, was, I was, my heart is full of joy. Now this guy is trying to evangelize me. I just was scared if you will do an altar call. But other than that, it was a wonderful time. As scripture, as scripture says, verse 11, anyone who believes in him will never put to shame. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will never be put to shame. And that's what I read in the beginning of, of, of the, our service, uh, Isaiah 28, 16. And we sing about this today. I just noticed the song that we sing was about it too. And it says, so this is what the servant Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a test stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. That the one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. If your trust is in the Lord, if you believe in him, he is the solid stone. Who, who's, who's, who's Isaiah talking about? Jesus. And Paul gets, borrows this expression, this text, this wonderful truth, this doctrine. And he brought it into Romans, right into Romans. And God is speaking to us, showing us today that who Isaiah was talking back then, who Paul, who Paul is mentioned, is the one, the only Savior, the Lord, the King Jesus. If your trust is in him, you're not going to be put to shame. You can face troubles and tribulations, but you will be because no one will cast you away from his hands. That's the doctrine of the servant grace for salvation for eternity. If he saved you, you belong to him. He's your Lord. Trust in him. Turn yourself to him. Cry out to him. If you believe in him, you will never be put to shame. I need to stop here to, call, to, tell, to remind you of something that just happened this week to our church. A week ago, we had a beautiful Lord uh, uh, Lord's Day here. Service. We had coffee outside. It was a very nice. Monday, you got a fire in the building. Wednesday. We get together. And there's people in this church that I saw Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and today. So we're going to come up with something for tomorrow, okay? It was a whole week. Wednesday, we came together to worship, didn't we? 
we had a Bible study. The room was packed. Praise the Lord for that. There's people sitting outside again or, or standing by the door or trying to squeeze in somehow. When uh, Thursday, man meeting, we had a wonderful meeting. I was so delighted. Our, our brother uh, Dominic led uh, the, the, the discussion. And to a point, there was a conversation between uh, Dominic and Tiago. <laughs> it was wonderful. And we learned so much. I was so thankful when I get back home. What a wonderful, what a wonderful talk. I could be sitting here and the two of them talk about this truth, the, the, so about the other. I could be there for three years of seminary. That was so wonderful. It was so great. So, so extraordinary. They were not giving me the opportunity to translate to the others to see what's going on. It was a wonderful time. Friday morning, we got a call. We, we got an inspector coming in. And after they told us that we will be shut down at least for three weeks, and everybody decide to do all the service in the back, right? Remember, you decide to do the service in the back. Everybody said, like, we should get together, we should do it in the back. The people that I call, everybody said, we should continue. I said, like, amen. And I thought to myself, nobody's thinking that probably they can rain or something like that can happen. I don't know if you were counting on coming with an with a, with a umbrella. Well, it's actually not necessary, but we, you didn't know that. And everybody said, we're going. I said, Amen. Friday morning, we got a call. The inspector came, and he turned around, and he said, you guys can open. Now we have 48 hours. This was 9 a.m. on Friday. Service is 9 a.m. on Sunday. We have 48 hours to turn this building upside down and change everything and rebuild outside for safety, all these things that needs to be done in 48 hours, less than 48 hours. I think yesterday, I think the last person left the building yesterday around 4 o'clock, 3 or 4 o'clock, everything was done. You came together, you came together, you clean up, you did, you, there were so many people here on Friday that we started doing yard projects because it was, it was more people than work to do in the building. Because you can't do everything inside like one on top of the others, right? And things needs to be done and dry for the next day. We, we paint the porch in the back of the house because there's too much people here. We did all this yard work that you see around, even little walls around, like, because there's too, too many people. Praise the Lord for that. Yesterday, my good friend, Pastor John Keegan, called me. He found out about this that happened here, and he called me. And um, he said, uh, so what's going on there? Oh, what's happening? Uh, you know, P Pastor John Keegan, some of you know from Fairlaw, a, a brother from OPC. And he said, so what, what happened? And uh, I said, uh, well, I said this, brothers, this is, I said this expression totally. I said, in the middle of the storm, I'm counting my blessings. And this is so true. Yeah, there was a storm. We call it a fire, but it was a storm. I was counting my blessings. What did we learn this week? First, that God protects us. It could have been in the middle of the night and everything will be gone when we come in the morning. Or at noon, somebody comes. God used the people, the neighbors, to tell us about the problem and come to off offer assistance. Understand what God does? Second thing that I learned is this, brothers and sisters, if in, 40 or if in 48 hours, without expecting a call, without even knowing that we could do this, we turn this building upside down. If we invest the same energy to go on the streets and call these people to, to Jesus Christ, can you imagine what's going to happen in this town? If in 48 hours we were able, by the work of the Spirit in us, put us together. One of my concerns, me and, and uh, our elder uh, Marcy, is how is this going to divide opinions? People, I don't know what's going to happen. No, this brought us together. By the power of the Holy Spirit that works, it dwells in us. And we turn this building upside down in 48 hours. Brothers, for the ones that were in here when we opened the doors to clean, it was so much garbage inside that the basement was flooded. Brothers, it was amazing what was done here, 48 hours. That led me to understand that we have so great potential in this church, this small little church. It's been a testimony for the people out there. God receiving 
calls and people talking and saying and 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 being impressed with with God did it. Now I want to tell you if we even in the middle of storms, even in the middle of difficulties, even in the middle of problems, we can trust in God. And I said, I said to my brother John Keegan, he said, um, so uh, um, we spoke about briefly about insurance, and we don't know still how that's going to be. And I said, God will provide. He said he provided the building in the first place, didn't he? He remind me, not that I didn't know that, but I said that's that's right, brother. He provide the building in the first place. He will provide this whole thing. I want you to understand, if we talk about a building or a campus or a fire like this, can you think about your salvation? Now, God, the Holy Spirit, work on us and lead us to get together and to turn this place upside down. Now, think about the work of the cross when the Son of God, God himself, came on earth to die on a cross. My brother John Keegan is very... Straight to scripture, he memorized so many, so many scriptures, it's unbelievable. And I know if you say something that is not exactly what the interpretation is, you will be pointing out right there. And I said, before he even say it, I said, I know, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to use the theological point here, a little bit out of context. I told him, and I said to, to him about insurance, I said, the one who started good work will finish. And I know that's about salvation. He goes like, yes, brother, because he's very, very... Straight on that. Listen, the one who started the good work, the work of salvation, will complete it. Trust in the Lord. You will not be put to shame. Trust in Jesus Christ. Turn yourself to God today. Stop trusting yourself on your works, on your deeds, or whatever you think. Turn to Christ Jesus. Whoever calls, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's the only Savior. He's Lord. He's the King of Kings. Turn to him. On verse 12 says, For there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. It doesn't matter. If you broke the third commandment, all ten. It doesn't matter what you did, what your past is. Turn to Christ today. Call upon the name of the Lord now. Call. And you will be saved. Turn to Jesus Christ. He will not take you, put you away from his presence. Cry out to him. If the Holy Spirit is putting your heart the seeds of the gospel and you believe in your heart, cry out to him. Confess that he is Lord. Speak with your mouth and you will be saved. Not because your words or your, you have power in what you say. No, because the power of God, the word of God is true. And he said if you turn to him, you call upon his name, you will be saved. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. How much blessings we had this week. And now I'm not even talking about the fire or the repairs or whatever. I'm talking about the fellowship of the saints over the course of the last two days. Or the whole week actually. What's such a blessing? We overdid on the donuts yesterday morning actually we did we overdid the donuts we were together we worked together we came into problems together we fix things together we grow in faith we have a, uh, the fellowship we have people from other church calling us and trying to help us and see pastor johnny serafini called me early in the week he got a, a text message <laughs> and he was very concerned and he called me, and I had a good time talking to my brother. And he wants, he said, told me, listen, should we start collecting funds to help you guys? And I said, well, not as now. Let's, let's see what's going on. But he was so concerned. He was so concerned. From North Carolina, you know, our brothers from Sola Gratia, they, they send an email out asking prayers for our church. This God's kingdom. Why everybody's concerned? Because this is not Dunkin' Donuts. 
definitely not Starbucks. But this is not Dunkin' Donuts or any other store. This is God's kingdom and the people of God, they concern and they care for one another. That's why I said yesterday, and I'm going to repeat it today, I'm counting my blessings, how many blessings this week? It's, it's, it was, was clearly God being glorified in our lives. Putting an effort was 10 p.m. on Friday. Brothers, you work all day on Friday, the ones you could. You came after work, after five people start showing up, showing up, showing up. At 10, was the last people leaving, it was around 10. 7 a.m., when I get in the building, 7 a few, a few minutes, was already people here. The same people that were here until 10. Do you understand that? that that's God, God's work in people. You, you, and, and you say, like, you, you probably in your mind, you were like, this pastor is always happy about everything, you know. Look, can I not be? Can I not be? Can I just let it slide? Can I just pretend it didn't happen? Do you notice any difference in this campus this morning? Like if you want to focus on the, on, on the little damage in the front of the, of the church building, uh, be my guest. I have so much around to see how many wonderful, great, great things that God did. And then I look to this text and I say, whoa, hold on. It's a greater one than, that, than the, all of those, which is that Jesus saved me. And that nothing tops that. He saved me. He is my Lord. He is the cornerstone. And we sing about that today. My faith is in him. I trust him. I will never be to put to shame. And when I say I never will be put to shame, is we conquer even death and uh, by Christ. Christ conquered for us even death or, or, or any kind of difficulties or whatever it is. And it doesn't matter because we have eternal life. Because God raised him from the dead is clear in the text. How rich is this text? I, I think I could be preaching on this text for the rest of the day. You want to try me? Because it's so rich. There's so many things here. It's so wonderful. I have to be honest. I cut the text in half. When I start preparing this sermon, I put half of the sermon, half of the text. Uh, like, I think from verse, uh, until verse 10. But then I look at what was the following text. And I go like, I know I got to have these three verses. And then I look again. And there was more to add. And I said, like, let me stop now. Because this sermon will never end. I would love to preach the whole chapter in one, one day, one, one shot, because it's so much of the whole the old, uh, chapter, chapter 10, because it's so rich. And listen, call upon the name of the Lord today. If you never did before, call until you're saved. Call until the Holy Spirit changed you. But if you are saved, never stop calling on the name of the Lord. Not in vain. Not just because everybody does, not without thinking, but in prayers. Maybe you need to go home today and humble yourself before the cross and ask the Lord to help you. Turn to Him. Turn to Him today. He's our only hope. And we don't need anything else. We need only one thing. We need Jesus Christ. We live in a society, in, especially in the United States, that tells you that you, need so, you need so many things. No, you don't. You need only one thing. You need Jesus Christ. That's all you need. That's all you need. Now call on the name of the Lord. Let's call on the name of the Lord together now. You want to stand? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we are so thankful for all you have done. And how did you save us? And Father, we ask you, Lord, have mercy on us. Help us to call in your name, not in vain, not in, without thinking. But help us, Lord, to be humble before the cross. And if there's anyone uh, here in this room or online that doesn't have you as a Lord and Savior, we ask you, Lord, visit them today. They may turn to the cross 
and they may be saved. And for all the others that are already saved, may this be a reminder that daily we need to turn to the cross. We need to cry out to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. You may